Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome back to another episode of the Reliability Matters podcast. Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. Beyond the buzzwords, what does all that mean? My guest today is David Graham, Chief Technology Officer of 4IR.UK, a wholly owned subsidiary of Internet of Things focused British systems. 4IR.UK specializes in creating monitoring, control, and automation solutions, often based on the multi plug edge computing platform for manufacturing environments. They also provide consultancy and development for other Industry 4.0 applications. I was intrigued by a webinar presented by David entitled A Decade of Industry 4.0. And today, I'll speak with David about his thoughts, experiences, and opinions of Industry 4.0. Hey, David. Hello, Mike. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being my guest today. I appreciate you being here. And uh, we, are, we are oceans apart. I'm sitting here in California on a sunny uh, afternoon, and uh, you are in England, uh, quite uh, getting to be late at night. So I appreciate your, your, your time travel. I've been having to support um, customers in Asia. So I've, my, my body clock is upside down at the moment, so I don't really mind the late start. When I was a little bit younger building my business, you know, we did business around the world. And as I said, I'm in California, and I remember lying in bed at night responding to my Asian emails because they're, you know, they're, uh, they're there. And then they uh, getting up in the morning. Here. Exactly. And then getting up uh, very early in the morning, responding to all my European emails before they go home. So there was, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of like the former, you know, British empire, the sun never set on, on our business. And I guess the same can be said for yours. Yeah. I'm in the early days, uh, 30 years ago <laughs> of your journey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, let's so talk a little bit. On. Yes, you're very welcome. Thanks for being here again. Um, so you're chief technology, chief technology officer of 4IR.UK. Um, tell me, I'm intrigued by just the company name alone. I always find, find it intriguing to find what's the genesis behind a company name. What does it stand for? It usually has some meaning. So tell me a little bit about the company name, and then let's talk just a little bit about uh, what your company does. Well, that's an interesting one because actually I don't have a company name. So I've come to the conclusion as soon as you as soon as you start a business and um, uh, don't have a uh, you, you kind of start and you don't have a name for it, then you kind of started. I've, I've worked on so many projects over the years. I've had all the branding and all the, the, the nice logo and the project hasn't gone anywhere. And 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 with this one, uh, it was kind of all. Uh, we just had to scramble and, and get it started. I, I sold the, the, the kind of seeds of the company a, a few years later when I worked as an equipment manufacturer in the equipment manufacturer as a software engineer. And um, I was sowing the seed for many years and then suddenly the opportunity came along with, with um, for some investment um, and some mentorship over three months. Um, and, and actually I was working my uh, notice period at the former employee at the time so it, it was a case of um, the, the name, the origins of the name is Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, I believe, you can correct me on this, I believe it's more of a British terminology of the Industry 4.0. Yes, I've heard it before, but you're right. I think it, uh, it was coined in, in your part of the world and um, hasn't yeah. quite been no. adopted universally. Uh, but um, so do you trade under that name or did you just decide to call the company name the same name as your website, which would be a brilliant move, by uh, the way? Again, again, I, I have no answer for that. I, I don't have a company name. Uh, so British Systems is the parent entity, okay. which is the, inte the intention was that there's going to be industrial uh, part, there's going to be a consumer part, and then there's going to be a software platforms part. So the multi-plug trade, uh, trades under the, the software platform part. Mm -hmm. Um, if I was honest, probably I was just trying to um, hijack the term um, for the same reason you're saying it's a good move. I was hoping the UK government would support me in that move, but they've been kind of distracted over the last 10 years 
So I haven't got the kind of support I would expect um, over that period of time. So yes, you're right to highlight that if someone sees 4 r they probably don't know what it means. So I have to uh, think about that in the future. Here's a, it's a here's nice a, short, short domain. Here's a uh, potential uh, business for you. Uh, you can come up with a um, uh, industry 4.0 connected revolving door and maybe install it on number 10 Downing Street. Oh. That would, yeah. is it too soon uh, to say that? Is it too soon? Uh, we, we'll, see, we'll see how that what pans out. I'm just glad. Actually, I'm just the, glad the, the UK. The, Sorry. The domain, 4hour.uk domain, actually came from a, um, an MP who was chairing the uh, cross-party task force, or whatever you want to call it, um, uh, to discuss and to help the fourth industrial or the industry 4.0. Um, and I just watched the... the the expiry date on that domain and then got it as soon as it <laughs> expired. That's great. So, I, I picked up a few. I've, I've, I, I'm a bit of a, a domain squatter, a URL squatter myself. I've picked up a few when I've, I've been surprised they were available. You know, I, I check certain ones on a regular basis and every once in a while, it's like, there it is and, and just grab it. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. You know, it's but, a bad habit. You know, I, I have a, a classic Mustang, a 1968 Mustang, and I own the domain uh, mustangcarclub.com. And I was amazed to find it was available. I don't have a car club. I don't intend to start a car club. But someday, I, I think I'll get an email from Ford or, or some enthusiast that finds that, that, uh, that name of value. But uh, I do enjoy owning it, even though it doesn't really point to anything uh, at the moment. But <laughs> same, same thing. Yeah, I've, I've had to let, let a few domains go because they're just wasting my money. Yeah, they're good at the moment, <laughs> but it's death by a thousand cuts. They're all, you know, $20 a year. And <laughs> you realize yeah, you exactly. own about 80 of them and yeah, it gets a little mm. pricey. Um, so your, your non-company actually makes some real products. And um, we're going we're gonna to talk in a little, a little while about some of the products you make. Not to hype your products. That's not the goal. That's not ever the goal of the show, but just to put your um, expertise and, and your experience um, into context. Um, industry 4.0 seems to be tied to you know, the term, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, which first thing that pops into my mind was what was the third? What was the second? What was the first? You know, we do, do we go back to the Iron Age? Do we go back to the industrial modern age? Um, in late 1800s, 1900s, you know, 19th, 20th century. Um, where do you have in your in your head anyway the world according to David anyway? Do do you have uh, a sense of what the third represented? Maybe what the the predecessors represented? I think Industry three point came way before my time, so I can't really comment on that. But I do remember being in education, um, growing up, and the internet was born, um, and so I think that was the major change. Um, but like many things in life, we, we kind of put things in boxes and we say that's the internet and that's, that's only used for the internet. Uh, browsers and things like that are only used for the internet. Um, but what, that's, what that created is a whole different group of people out there creating content, creating software for the, for the internet. Um, and es essentially things started to divert outwards. Um, you had uh, traditional software engineers creating applications on desktops. Um, and then you had uh, people creating websites. But of course, that was, again, that was enforcing the concept of a server in a remote location. And then you got something that you, you look to um, look at from your, your, your computer. Um, and so I think what the fourth industry or industry 4.0 really was was um the, the the flag of that change to say we need to pull in the, that kind of talent into our industry how we did that i can i can answer that question now but if i knew the terms now uh, then i pro i probably would have uh, um it would probably would have helped me and the answer is the edge which is what they used to call on premise software so it's using browsers but within a corporate network and then taking the stepping stones outwards um, to then go to the cloud or the internet as we know it. Um, so an intranet 
kind of concept it's basically versus an exactly internet. this is the thing about Berm uh, that's this is the thing about terminology isn't it it's all it's all that, just a little bit of change here and it's got a new buzzword attached to it yeah but and in yes. some industries it means something slightly different it's almost like a dialect you know it's same language different dialect yeah <clears throat> yeah um the webinar that i kind of found you um uh, presenting uh, what, you talked about what Industry 4.0 is, or or was and wasn't. Um, in yeah. in my world, as an equipment manufacturer, there is a lot of emphasis on, you know, is your machine connected? You know, we in our world we collect a lot of data, and we make that data kind of in the edge environment, as you were speaking. It's the data is all kept within the equipment. It can be extracted, it can be searched, it could be sorted, um, and it can be presented visually or digitally to a user from the equipment. We think that's wonderful, right? We think that's, that's, that's a milestone in our world. Um, now, all of a sudden, um, people are asking if it could, if it could go up to a cloud or, or, or be useful to another piece of equipment or another piece of software that could crunch the data and analyze it and, and interpret it or whatever they want to do with it. Um, and the answer is, yeah. And who's listening? Who wants, what outside of our small little bubble, our, uh, who, what use is that information outside of our small little bubble? The, the next machine doesn't really care what our machine is doing, in, in our world anyway. Um, so. There are a lot of misconceptions. There are a lot of people that ask, is your machine, you know, does it store information? Does it collect data? Yes. And then many of our customers, a, a measurable percentage of our customers, don't even use it. They just like to know it's there. Um, it's, it's a feature. And to some, it's valuable. And to some, it's, it's just a feature. Um, are there misconceptions with the collection of all this data and, and what use the data can have and what... 4.0 can offer that are really just misconceptions or are they just, um, are people just not appreciating the possibilities? Does that rambling yeah, question yeah. make sense? Um, I think the first misconception is you have to store the data. So if no one's listening to that data, then it just doesn't, either doesn't get created because it's intelligent and it knows that no one's listening or it gets created and just disappears. I think that's that's the first hearing the commentary of of the industry over the last ten years. That was like we're creating lots of data and we don't know what to do do with it. Well, then don't store it. Um, you need to have some sort of endpoint listening to it. Um, if you look at the uh, CFX, that's exactly how that works. You got you got an event, um, and then you subscribe to that um, message. We, you have a message and you have an event and you subscribe to the message. And if you've got subscribers, the subscriber takes hold of that data and then they do what they want with that data. Um, and they can then store it themselves. So I think the the question of why, stop asking why. <laughs> you don't know why, you know. There's lots of technology out there today that wouldn't be created if they, someone had to go with a justification document to say, this is why we need it. Um, beforehand, and then you know it's a classic, um, it's classic. Uh, do something before the customer asks for it. So create the data before the customer is asking for that data. Every part of your machine needs to be pushing out an event or you know a little bit of data to say this has happened, and then just let the community do interesting stuff with it. Yeah, we that's kind of the approach we took when we. When we uh, moved up to the computer technology that would allow us to store data, when we started switching things from analog to digital, for example, sensors, um, clearly we had the ability, if we were reacting to that input, we can store the data from that input. So we just started collecting everything, not knowing why. We just thought, well, maybe it'll be helpful someday. We'll just start collecting it almost like a stamp collector or a coin collector, you know, you just, or rock collector. You just pick up things that interest you at the time and later find out if they're valuable. And it has turned out to be quite valuable because in ways we didn't anticipate. 
um, for troubleshooting purposes. You know, we have access to all that data. We can see when a switch was went high or low or, or open or closed or whatever the case may be. We can, we can see a lot of data and we can then rebuild a time sequence and, and, and a series of events, almost like playing detective. Uh, it's become extremely, extremely helpful for troubleshooting, for fact finding when the customer says they never did this, yet the data shows this happened and, yeah. and the person's name, you know, uh, it's, um, it's quite valuable. So, so what you need to do is take a, a step back almost. So you've created the, you're capturing the data and you're storing the data and you're using the data. So now you need to go back three steps and just expose the data to, on an interface and then create your uh, data storage uh, solution and then your data analysis solution. You're, so then you're kind of eating your own dog food because you're using the interface that other people might use. And then you're also building your own solution onto that, but I can build my own solution onto that. And really, you know, if, if you, I don't think it's going to happen over the next 10 years, but maybe the 20, ultimately the intelligence is going to go upwards, but you can't get to that intelligence level until we can actually get to the people that create the solutions right at the top can, can get to the really, um, raw states of the machine or, sure. you know, control it. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you talked in your, I'm going to reference several things in your webinar because I, I took a lot of notes because I, several things just um, pushed the button uh, with me. You talk about a one-to-one -one relationship um, with, uh, between people and technology. And that, that's an interesting subject for me because I, I find our, in, our industry is, is, very unique in the way we embrace technology and people. And sometimes we're, we battle, those two battle. Sometimes there's they're, they're yeah. synergy, uh, often there's not. Uh, explain what you meant by um, the, the relationship between people and technology in, in, in your world. Well, I think actually it's good engineering practices, isn't it? So you, you rely on people to own, own certain things and they have ownership of how to create that solution in their own um, way. They can use that solution or that technology or that technology, it's up to them. Um, we see it even in the social media generation. You see some certain social media is more, um, well, Facebook is now for the for the parents. Um, Instagram is <laughs> and, sort of and halfway. Grandpa grandparents and, and great grandparents, yes. yeah because that's how I got onto it because it was about connecting with people I knew. But then Instagram is about, you know, um, being a celebrity and then TikTok I haven't even tried. So I, I can't, I can't come up with that one. Um, but essentially it's, it's about understanding that technology is now generational. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to continue that in that way. So we have, you know, we have software engineers of the nineties or the eighties, nineties who were, starting from a blank page um, and they have kind of morphed into more of a, um, a software developer which then uses technologies or platforms uh, which means they can really get um, code out the door get, get solutions out the door much quicker than, than, than their predecessors but it's to understand I think the banking industry kind of went through this problem which is understanding that technology gets old um, and now we have to realize that the stuff we created in the nineties that were probably, you know, we probably, re um, kept on life support in the two thousands and maybe into today, you need to move on now. Um, uh, the other one-to-one -one relationship is just about, as I started at the beginning about teams, giving teams ownership and making sure that people can own, um, certain elements of your solution. Um, a good example is, that, is on your um, smartphone. So if you notice everything on your smartphone is an app, which is logical because it's obviously only does one thing. But if you consider that there is also a settings app, so this isn't built into the actual operating system of the, uh, your smartphone, it's actually a separate app. That just shows you that you, could just, you should break everything down into little modules. And as I said before, it's good, good engineering practice to make sure that everything Everyone has to ownership of certain things and, you know, certain if a, a team needs to do it, wants to do it in a certain way, then they should be able to do it in a certain way. But it's just that kind of ownership and that um, generational change that we need to appreciate. 
Um, and again, the internet, the change of the internet created a, a, a new generation of developers. Um, and now, interestingly, when, you know, when the iPhone came along in 2007, um, that rebought, that re, uh, cre recreated the application developer. So someone who actually just creates an application onto a phone. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm going to have to get used to the fact that life is circular. <laughs> That's true. What we learn from history is we learn nothing from history. Um, yeah. My father uh, was an immigrant to this country, and, and he um, got his education here, uh, went to college here, uh, worked by uh, night, and went to college by day, and got a degree in computer programming. He immigrated here in 1957, to put that into context. And by the early 60s, he had his degree in, as a computer programmer. And uh, back in those days, he, IBM, of course, was the manufacturer of choice, maybe the only mm -hmm. manufacturer at the time. And he was hired by a, by a company to integrate the computer programs, or, or to write computer programs on their mainframe. Because back then, you bought a computer they didn't sell software. You had to write your own code. They were just hollow machines, you know, ready yeah. for punch cards. And uh, he would, system. he would, yeah, he would write the code. And the first thing, one of the first things he had to write was some accounting software because you didn't, you didn't buy QuickBooks or you know, whatever. You, you, you had to kind of write your own. So he had to go to take some night courses in college again and get a, a crash course in accounting just to get basic accounting principles. I think it was running payroll or something. And he learned enough so that he could take, his, take that knowledge and filter it through his coding knowledge and write code for the computer uh, so they could have this automated payroll system. Um, and I remember going to his office on weekends and nights sometimes. He'd, he'd take me there. I thought I was Captain Kirk, you know, sitting in the deck of the Enterprise. Uh, you know, I was playing with the key punch machines. And to me, that was as space age as one can get. Um, but well, that mechanical sound. Oh, it was amazing. And, yeah. and the word crash, the word crash had two meanings back then. You know, right? <laughs> crash meant the cart fell over and 10,000 punch cards fell on the floor. Uh, or he'd, he'd load them all in and it'd take one card, one card, one card, one card, like a dealer in Vegas, you know, one card, one card. And then all of a sudden it would stop and lights would come on and he'd have to pull that card out and kind of hold it up to the light and go, oh, you know, okay, I see what's wrong. Write a new card, slip it back in, recompile it. It was quite the ordeal. But anyway, um, I, I digress. Um, back then, you needed, you know, a couple of skills, at least you needed to know how to code. And you needed to know about what you were coding, in this case, mm -hmm. accounting. Yeah. Um, so over the years, since the 60s, uh, when computers kind of first in a main mainstream way started to come on the scene to today, um, we, we hear about, you know, software developers and app developers and, and there's new names that, you know, there was no app developers back in, in my dad's day, or at least not by, by title. Um, and you talked in your webinar about the changes since the eighties, um, you know, which is probably the beginning of your world, you know, roughly, um, that, that you've witnessed. And, you know, we've gone from not from, but you know, we have software engineers, software developers, IT professionals, uh, uh, DevOps, developer ops. Uh, explain those different roles, and and do we still have multiple roles, or are they all kind of morphing into into one new kind of super role? Does that question make? I, I any guess sense? it depends who you're talking to and what company you're talking to. So, um, I would say that. Uh, Definitely, things have become more um, modular in what you specialize in. So you would, once upon a time, as you say, you would be a, um, you would do everything. Um, I remember creating my first website, and I would do all the code, you know, everything, design, whatever. Um, and if you look at uh, today, you have front end developer, which is the the user interface, but that that might be broken down into the actual logic, that might be broken down into the style. Um, and obviously you've got the design, that's another person. And then you've got back-end developers that are the, the server-side stuff. Um, and the reason I bring up the web constantly is because this is where the changes have occurred and this is where we need to start to um, learn from. 
So a lot of the web, web development these days is done by multiple people. Um, they've got their own technologies they're using. They it all um, it all glues together nicely. Um, but it's on, on the on the look, taking a few steps back. It looks really complex because it's so many different units and st things like that to, to to look at. You know, once upon a time I could do it all myself. I, I do it all myself, but in the sense of you know it used to be a flat HTML file and that's that would be it. Where today it's more complex than that. Um, so g going back to like application um, software engineers, as we as you've spoken before. Uh, it's very much a blank page. Your platform is your, maybe your operating system, and you could kind of call your programming language to be a platform in a sense. But you're creating things from blank page. And you know what? If, if you're working for a company that doesn't know any different, you're going to sit down there and code out and reinvent the wheel and and start all for fresh. And I think that's where some of our, some of our, that's where parts of our industry is at at the moment you know lots of people um in in silo companies not not um there's no community so no one's really sharing information it's behind closed doors it's secure it's, you know every it's hardware so it's all you know ip and top secret and can't tell anyone who customers you're working with all that kind of stuff and so there's a, just a lack of community so there's a lot of reinvention of the wheel out there and then we can move on to uh what they call software developers. And again, this is really by definition, but ultimately they're using software platforms that they can get off the shelf. And then parts of a uh, lots of functionality comes for free. And that's the beauty of it. You know, you can get up something within a few lines of code or maybe even drag and dropping things. Um, but going back to your original question of whether we're going, is it more specialized or is it going, going together again. DevOps is, is a classic example where once upon a time you would have someone creating your solution and then you would throw it over the wall to someone that has to deploy that solution. And DevOps is kind of, again, it's more webby, but it's, it's kind of the alignment of someone who deploys their solution and makes it at the same time or afterwards. So, um, but I see good reason for that because there is a tendency within the engineering community of throwing things over walls and, and trying to get someone else to do your dirty work. So it's a nice way of trying to bring in together the, the, the consequences of what you do. Same with, same with testing. We've got now we've got, we've got um, test driven development. So we try and create our own test um, scenarios. So we're not just chucking it over the wall to the test team to, to, for them to break it. Yeah, I know uh, today's, our, you know, I used to write the code for our uh, computers, when for our equipment, when I first started the company 30 years ago. And back then it was, it was basically, well, it was basic. It was a, a certain dialect of basic. And, and I learned basic in the 70s when I was in high school, right? I learned to, I hate to say code, because anyone who really does coding probably doesn't even know what basic is. You know, it, 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 it is the <laughs> language... It's it's the ABCs. It's the you know C spot run <laughs> level of uh, of coding. Uh, but I was able to create code that our machines would operate on in in a really simple interface, um, and and it worked well. And then of course uh, we we graduated up and and you know we started hiring uh, software people to to do our code. And I remember the early days of our first PC based equipment machines that were controlled by an actual PC. You know, we wrote different types of code for that. And we used to have some graphing uh, capabilities. And, and we kind of wrote our own code to build our own graph. And it was useful, but it kind of looked like an old Atari game. It looked like a, you know, heavily pixelated, um, something that Atari would put out, Mario Brothers, you know, type, type thing uh, from the 80s. And, but it worked. And now we just, we just, you know, basically buy an app, you know, and, and incorporate that module, you know, a graphing module. And, and, and that's all they do. And it's beautiful. But you have to, the thing about that is you have to know it's out there available. Yes. You know, it's been publicized or you know about it, or maybe the engineers that you work with know about it before. So that's where the, the kind of educational part needs to come to play. Right. Because if you don't know that, you do it yourself. That's right. That's right. And then you don't do it quite as well. And it looks a little dorky, but it's still functional. 
And, you know, the, it's long been said the enemy of great is good. So it's, it's, it's okay. It's good. It's fine. Uh, so you kind of go on to something else because we're not, we're not in the graphing business. We're in the cleaning business in my case. Um, but there are people, it turns out, that are in the graphing business and they can make our cleaner look even cooler if, if we could use them, if we only know about them. But you're right. The industry is very siloed. Um, not just the software world, but our industry in general is very siloed. We are uh, working hard to solve the same problems and not always sharing the results, which is why I'm a huge fan of conferences and symposiums where people get up and they talk about, they get real, they get you know, talk about the problems their company had and how they, how they overcame them. And sometimes they're, they're presenting that to competitors, uh, but that's fine because the tide raises all boats, right? And, mm, and um, yeah. what we teach, we can learn. So it, it, uh, it works out well. Uh, you, you, you talked in, in your uh, webinar about an effect that I've talked about many times on this show, which is the, what we like to call the silver tsunami, the grain out of our industry. Um, there are companies that historically have kept on staff a subject matter expert. And I, I, there's, there's a couple, two or three that come to mind in, in our industry where these are um, very large um, prime contractors, defense contractors in this case, and, and they're heavy in the aviation business. And they have one person who is an expert on a particular subject, and their job is to support all of the facilities throughout the world that this company has in that subject line and, and teach and present and you know, be the, the fixer. Um, while many of those people are retiring and they're not being replaced by a person of equal stature from an experience standpoint. So that means that the younger people that are joining the industry to, you know, to handle the attrition, they're graduating from university with a degree, say, in electrical engineering, which is great. They understand how electrons work from a principal standpoint, but they don't know how much squeegee pressure a stencil, should, a stencil printer should have. They don't know what type of tape to use to attach a thermocouple to get a thermal profile through a reflow oven. They don't know whatever the things you need to know in your world are. Um, and those are things that you kind of learn on the job. You learn it on the production floor. You learn it through trial and error. You learn it through experience. You learn it through um, tribal knowledge, you know, handed down to the next generation. Uh, and without those subject matter experts, those sage people, uh, we are kind of in this perilous situation where who do you turn to? Well, call the vendor. The vendor will tell you. And that, that is an acceptable and could be a very um, decent way of, of handling that problem. But it also could be problematic because the vendor is going to provide information through a lens from their world. And, you know, Maslow's you know, uh, Maslow said, if all you have is a hammer, you see the world as a bed of nails, right? And, you know, my answer to every question, if you would say, Mike, my car doesn't start in the morning, I'd say, well, you need to clean more circuit boards because that's my world, right? Everything would, would involve cleaning. Um, so I think that uh, maybe in the software world too, I'm assuming people are getting old in the software world too. And is that phenomenon... Um, is that a, a real phenomenon within your world of, of um, you know, software development and, and all of that? Uh, is that silver tsunami and the aging out and the new people coming in either lacking the, the legacy experience uh, or, or older people lacking the newer experience? How is that playing out? Um, I think... I have no direct, I have observations, but yeah. I've no, no, no direct experience. There is, there is a feeling of, there are, a, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big company called Microsoft and it's just, uh, I've noticed that uh, a few poor releases have been released. Um, but I've got no, I've got no evidence of that, but you do get, you. You, you get a feeling that that's occurring, that there is a transition. And I think we, we have, when we talk about the, uh, 
silver tsunami. I, I've never actually thought about my industry, I must admit. You throw me a little bit there. Um, when, when we talk about uh, our industry, it's more you're going to have to uh, connect with other people outside their industry to survive, really. I can't, I don't think that's a, a good example of the squeezy pressure, but definitely software de development. Um, w this industry isn't appealing. You know, people want to go and work for a dot com or whatever. So the, the future is trying to work with people externally to our industry, trying to break it down and remove all the kind of jargon attached to it. Um, and um, and and create create small projects that you can kind of micromanage, well not micromanage, but you know you can kind of very easy deliverables. So you know majority of the stuff is going to be based on data. So it's that, that's a nice abstraction from uh, our industry. So it's it's about connecting with the digital economy as they call it, or what is now the, the kind of dot com industry. Um, in regards to uh, it, um, manufacturing industry, I, th I think we're, we're currently doing the, the solution, which is we're talking, we're starting to create this, this community. Um, there's lots of podcasts that have popped up in the last two years. And uh, this, is, this is an example of how we're going to solve it, I think, because you're going to get, uh, you're an equipment supplier, you're going to get customers talking about their uh, scenarios and situations. And then that's going to naturally create a community. Finally, um, so I think that's the answer to that that one in our in the manufacturing industry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, no, that <laughs> but it's, no, that's... it's one of those things. It's one of those things. I, I agree with mo most of the commentary I've read, which is it's not something I'm going to worry about because if it happens, it happens, and you kind of have to get on with it. Um, it is what it from is. my point, yeah. from my point of view, it's a positive because. Um, you know, all the restrictions that I've heard in the past, uh, whether it's the sales process or whether it's the security and all this kind of stuff, all it takes currently because of the community. So, well, there's lack of community, there's lack of conversation. All it takes is one gray beard, you know, senior member of, of staff to say, you know, we're not going to do that and it doesn't get done. So um, I'm pleased there's this buzzword of silver tsunami. It's, I, if I had it uh, 15 years ago, it would have been quite useful because I was at the point of thinking, well, I'm a young person. Maybe I've got this natural, you know, everyone's older than me. So everyone's going to be um, uh, negative towards change. But um, yeah, I spotted the silver tsunami many years ago and I, I'm, I'm pleased it's a buzzword now because it, I can finally say it out loud without being offensive. Right. Well, I think the people that would have been offended are, are more looking forward to retiring than sticking around feeling offended. So it's amazing yeah, they're, how they're ready. quickly it's occurring. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, well, which is posing all sorts of issues. This is not an economic show, but it's posing all sorts of issues for the economy because we're supporting the largest number of near geriatric population levels than ever in our country's history. And at least yeah. on my country's history, your country goes back a little bit, a little bit longer than mine. Uh, but uh, we've never had so many people facing retirement. And that becomes a very expensive age for uh, government services because we tend to get sicker and, you know, we're not contributing to the economy. There's a lot of talk over here about trying to get people back into employment. Yeah. Retired. Exactly. Yeah. Um, has, we're going to actually, I promise my audience, we're going to talk about Industry 4.0. We're going to get there, but there's, there's too many fascinating questions I have for David between now and then. Uh, COVID, you know, everything in life, I believe firmly everything in life has a silver lining. There's something good comes out of it, everything. And um, when I look at the pandemic that, you know, part of me likes to think we're out of it. Um, at least we're out of it from, from a normalcy standpoint. Yes, people are still getting sick. Tragically, people are still not surviving. Um, but from a, how it's impacting our daily life, at least that part's kind of come back to normal. We can travel without masks. We can, you know, we can stand fairly close to other people. Um, the mandates are, are largely gone. Uh, but I think one of the silver linings that came out is it forced, you know, everyone had to go home. It forced us to 
think differently about not having office culture, office think, cubicle think. Um, we were able to kind of, by necessity, reach out and get other solutions. And I'm thinking that maybe that has kind of opened industry's eyes to getting rid of the not invented here syndrome. You know, all of a sudden, David is now working from home. David finds this app that does an element of what he needs better than he does. And all of a sudden, people are outsourcing more, or at least they're more open to outsourcing. They're, they're, they're buying modules of predetermined code or whatever the case may be and incorporating them in to build a better mousetrap than they would have if they had developed it 100% in-house within the cubicles on the drafting tables, you know, to coin an old phrase. Um, has that been, I think you may have referred to that uh, in your webinar, uh, has that sense of it's not made here so we won't do it syndrome started to change in this more connected world that we live in? I think it just goes back to what's, what I said before, which is about education. I mean, I, the thing about our industry is normally it's behind. Normally it's cust very customer driven, very voice of customer. Uh, we're not going to do it until it's asked for. Just just like you were questioning about data earlier on. I'm not going to expose data until we know why you need it. Um, and so um, when you're in a situation when you have to do something for yesterday, uh, again, you get get front of your you get in front of your team. You say this is what needs to be done. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the, um, the the required results and the deliverable. It's very focused towards one customer, and then um, and then you have something that is made in house and not outsourced. Um, that said, if you're talking about like like it, recruitment and talent then yes covid has increased it's highlighted recruitment problems um i think they were already there to be fair um but it's it's uh, you it, to be to be everyone's benefit you can now recruit someone that doesn't live in your town or or within a certain region anymore um but at the same time you will lose people um you probably have you know, people have moved about. So um, I think, yeah, the, the concept of outsourcing, whether it's on a project base or, or a, a, you know, a solutions based or whether it's even just a one person uh, recruiting from afar, um, that's all changed. And I think it's, it's not the fact that someone's gone, yeah, we'll, we'll give this a try now. It's, I think everyone has to, has to do it now. Um, which is nice because it's just given everyone that just little bit of push that was naturally going to go towards that way um, anyway. Yeah, excellent. You talk about the first steps for implementation of Industry 4.0 and how it involves people. This is a people process yeah. here. Uh, walk me through those those people steps, if you can recall so that. The, so, the, so the kind of... You, you realize that you need to connect with uh, this community of people that you probably don't deal with on a day to day basis. You've, you know, it's the dot com, it's the internet, it's, it's, it's the, a, a completely different industry. So how do you start to connect with those kind of people? Now, the likelihood is your, your project's going to be, um, data based, data based. Um, so it's not going to be, it's your controls solution on your machine or, or in your factory is going to be the same, but this is about exposing your data and, and, and creating, um, remote control or remote monitoring or escalation systems. Um, so that's going to be a great little mini project for someone outside your business. Um, that doesn't work within manufacturing and doesn't, doesn't want to know about all the terminology. So I think the first step is, is uh, spoke up people i'm going to jump over to technology just quickly which is to which is to uh try to align your technology to the the, the industry that you're going to interact with because it's no point telling them to use this technology and then they have to skill up and that's what we used to do in the the days of software outsourcing we used to basically dump um your code base 
into another office, maybe in another part of the world, uh, and then just get on with it. Um, but then you would get all the business politics you would get at home, but just maybe cheaper labor, you know. So you need to align your technology to that new industry. Jumping back to people though, so you're in that situation, you don't know what to, um, what's the first step. The first step is talk to the people within. So you have your IT team, uh, which deal, probably deal with data. You might have a, you know, even if it's a one man band, um, it's, it, they know data and they also know people that in their industry. So talk to them, understand that you've probably already got the skill, but at the moment you're putting a, a sticker on their forehead and saying that's the only thing you do, but actually they can be a consultant. They can actually tell you what to do. So go and speak to your IT team. The other team to talk, speak to is your marketing team because they're probably uh, managing your website and they might be managing, you know, uh, an outsourcer or a, a digital agency as they call them. So go and speak to them. And that's your first point if you're and that's internally. Um, then look at, uh, look at any sort of uh, groups, business groups or manufacturing like that. The, the presentation you're referring to, I, I made to a, a manufacturing cluster in our, my area. Um, so just network generally locally and ask everyone else the same question in order to try to solve your, your issues. Um, but ultimately, you want to engage with the outside world, and currently, you're you're in a in a industrial unit, or uh, you know, on a away from the Googles and the, the 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 urban situations. I don't know what it's like in the US, but it, over here, you have the industrial park, and you know, it's completely away from the shops. It's completely away from anything else, and so you don't have that natural water cooler moment. You know, you don't have people bumping into each other. Um, so you, you're trying to connect with these people. Um, so try to um, create some what they would call technical challenges, which is basically a problem. But no one likes to no one likes to disclose their problems. Apparently, they they only like to set challenges. So set some technical challenges, um, and those can connect to. Again, you've got to start really simple. You, it could be a son or daughter of your, one of your employees. It could be the local college, it could be the local school, and then kind of build up to any other businesses that might want to commercially create something using that challenge. Um, again, at that point, you should be using some, some sort of web technology to use as a, a common conversation ground, I guess. Um, internally within your company, again, this is those challenges can be run by someone, a single person, or um, a junior member of staff. Um, again, it's just a, a, a first stab at being a project manager, but externally to something, to someone you're interacting with externally. Um, the final one, and that's, we've talked about this quite a bit, which is this community concept. Um, try to be visible. You know, we, we, we work within a, a very silo industry, secretive. I've spoken about this all before. Um, try to be visible um, and that you know, those people that are running those mini projects give them a, a way to be visible on the internet allow them to go onto YouTube and create some videos or allow them to have a micro site on your a domain if you can't give them control of the actual domain or and, and don't worry about styling and corporate identity and all that kind of stuff just give them that that remove those silly barriers that can stop someone projecting themselves and saying look this is what i can do and this is who i work with and and these are the projects i uh I've managed it's all in the spirit of innovation really all this kind of stuff um and i think that would be your first step and then you'll realize if you can then create some relationships externally then then you are you're not software outsourcing because as I say, that's that's dumping your entire code to someone else. That it, it, it's them. You're creating a little mini ecosystem. There's the APIs. Um, the the biggest challenge I found is, again, I'm someone else. Well, I'm, I've been in, inside the industry and now I'm outside the industry trying to talk to these equipment manufacturers. Is you have to go by about three people to get the right question or whatever. 
or maybe the software you need or whatever. So again, it's about that visibility element. Make sure you people can go up to your website, download the thing. Um, I mean, ideally, you need a kind of some sort of simulator so someone can create your uh, interact with your solution um, externally. Um, but again, going back to that eating your own dog food concept, you know, try to use the things you create for externally, but internally. Um, and that's my. And then you'll you'll be an um, industry 4.0 company, and you can put that on your. <laughs> there you go, and <laughs> on and, your website. and yeah, uh, certification. And as a <laughs> industry 4.0 company, um, obviously, if I'm purchasing equipment, the, a company that, say, a contract manufacturer or an OEM, you know, they're not going to be, in all likelihood, they're not going to be writing the code that connects all these machines for a greater purpose. They're going to they're going to want to buy machines maybe that are that have a CFX stamp on it or a Hermes stamp it's something. They're going to buy it, you know, pre-made. Um, in, in in most cases, some companies maybe with legacy equipment and we're going to get into that in just a second. Um, you know, might have to write stuff on their own just to get it to keep working, but um, for the most part they're going to buy stuff that is um, 4.0 ready. And in that context, there seems to be a couple, probably more, but there's a couple that I'm aware of, of different industry 4.0 standards, uh, which are you know, uh, communication protocols, for lack of a better description. Uh, Hermes is one, CFX, which is the IPC uh, endeavor, is another. Um, is this a I'm going to I'm going to predate you when I say this but hopefully you've heard this term before. Is this a Betamax versus VHS competition and one will prevail or is this, you know, if I say I'm going to go with CFX and then Hermes wins, am I out or now do I have to translate or what's the what's the reason there's a couple at least a couple of standards and will one rise to the top in your opinion? Well, I think if I go by the marketing of, of the two standards, um, they like to market it as one's the horizontal, one's the vertical. Um, what I like to say is Hermes is for the, at the benefit of the equipment manufacturer of that particular part of the production line. Um, and if you can get your line up to Hermes, use the Hermes standard, then your, the functionality of your equipment will provide you with enhanced functionality out of the box. CFX is more, um, it is more vertical, but it's also more, uh, it's got a lot more you, you can do with it. But at the same time, it's more generalized. And, and what they're trying to do is as with all these standards, they're, they're taking raw technologies and they're putting a brand name over them and they're packaging up certain like messages. Um, so actually, you know, you could you could take the the CFX and use it for your own purpose. You could create your own message and you could have a, you know, a, a bespoke man, a bespoke brand kind of messaging format between certain brands and um, things like that. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I, I don't really worry about the branding. As I said, it's, to me, it's about the technologies under the, under the hood. And um, to me, CFX is uh, message and then subscriber, and then that subscriber gets that message. So it's very general purpose. Um, where the Hermes is more, um, is more a, a equipment's own messaging standard, but exposed to the community of that type of equipment. So my answer would be go with both. Um, that that said, you know, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be unreasonable for someone to say, can we run Hermes over CFX? And I'm sure someone's already demonstrated that. Um, the early day, um, again, the marketing is about speed. Um, so Hermes switches by the network switch. So the message goes to the network switch. It's IP based. So it then gets diverted off to the next machine that needs to go to, uh, where CFX is a, 
software broker so it has to go up to a software level and then it has to then come back down again um but really you know this is this is a, a classic situation i've had in my career where people were talking about speed and my 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 um answer has always been you just refine it okay if you know something's going to have a bit of latency you make sure you do a a look up that little bit earlier if you can you don't leave sure. it to the last minute you don't leave it till the ball comes in the machine you do it when it's you know some, you just, some other point you don't need a faster answer you need an earlier question yeah there you yeah. go yeah yeah yeah, yeah that, that, so, that makes sense um i would so i would say from a from a what i would say is is if you've got equipment that's going to be a hermes enabled um upgrade your line and then you'll get the advanced features of what that equipment will give you and um but the the high level systems would probably use cfx to collect that data um, if i'm a skunk works kind of facility i'm not sure if you're familiar with that term that's that's no. the skunk works is where uh, the U.S. developed their stealth weapons in the early days. The SR-71 Blackbird, you know, was developed at the Skunk Works, which was, I think, part of Lockheed, if I remember right. Uh, it was a super secret um, airfield where they developed all, a lot of the state-of-the-art weapons during the Cold War. And so if I'm that kind of company, Skunk Works kind of company, in the secret of work, is there a standard that prevents my data from going up to the to the cloud and back down again, as you mentioned, CFX would, um, if I interpreted your answer correctly, or, you know, what, what keeps my data safe? Am I concerned about where my data goes? Now, my data might just mean um, a board just left uh, an oven on its way to the AOI. That's not really a national secret, but there are some companies that, you know, our equipment, uh, for example, our cleaning equipment, um, sometimes when we sell it to certain companies and certain facilities, we have to disable the Wi-Fi drivers. We have to literally put physical locks in all the USB ports uh, just because that's what they want, right? They're concerned about that kind of stuff. Um, is, does Industry 4.0 provide a weak link to those who are you know, uber, secure, uber concerned about, about security? No, because they're already, secure, they're already concerned about security and there'd be they'd be pushing back at it for a start. They won't, they won't go down this route. And this is why we're, we're in such a delay at the moment because of that question. Um, secondly, if you've got, uh, my answer to that is always go and speak to someone who specializes in security. Again, it's that reinvention of the wheel problem. You know, you, you said you mentioned it going up to the cloud. It's not going to go up to the cloud. It's going to go up to a, a broker that's locally in your, in your, your network. Okay. So but it's an intranet, um, solution then it doesn't go well, it can be you know it, it can be anywhere right it can be anywhere yes yeah, the thing of this is this is the same struggle i have with hermes so hermes is machine to machine mm -hmm. but actually it goes on a star network you know it goes to your switch so why can't they all you know talk to each other <laughs> so it's trying to it's trying to emulate smema which is obviously machine to machine um and yeah i would just say you know again go talk to your it team talk to people that know this 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 problem and they've solved it 20 years ago rather than worrying about it um, i'm not saying go and implement it without having that conversation sure. and having the safeguards See, but also yeah. don't let's let's not stop progress by because someone said once upon a time that this is going to go you know all this kind of stuff well chances and, are that person who said it is going to retire sometime soon so yeah maybe i know this is great <laughs> the silver lining of the silver tsunami we're going to have so many problems in the next 10 years, aren't we? Um, you mentioned the word SMEMA, uh, which of course was a, you know, earlier, not earlier, they're still around, uh, but a standards protocol, communication protocol. Um, if someone has some legacy equipment, um, and I'm, I'm set, I already know the answer to this because I'm, I'm setting you up you here. If someone has <laughs> some legacy equipment and they want to um, say, uh, they buy something that, that's got the Hermes protocol and they want it to be able to talk to some older SMEMA machines, something tells me you guys have come up with a solution for that. Yeah, and it, might we, look we a just... little, it might look a little bit like that. Oh, yeah. Right, okay. So, Quinton, yeah, we got to get to the names. We, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let you off the hook on the, the names of your interesting <laughs> products here, but um, tell me what this is right here. 
So it just it just converts the SMEMA signals to the Hermes equivalents. So you lose, I guess you lose the intelligence of the, the Hermes standard. But what it as it goes through the SMEMA equipment, you want to you want to keep hold of that uh, data of the board that's traveling down the line. So it just simply stores it until the SMEMA signal at the other end goes. I'm going to release that board. Right. So it's an adapter. Right. And, and, and if it was... We fell into it. <laughs> and if it wasn't Hermes, it could be CFX, which is the other... Uh, what, yeah. What's the name of that? I can't read it on my monitor. What's the name of this machine? Jasper. Jasper, okay. We've got this Quentin under development. So um, again, it's, it's the thought process of where, whether you know, Hermes will run on, uh, over CFX or whether right. you would need some... You would need some steam interlocking, which is quite um, uh, common, you know, to stop start the line currently loses steamer. Have you got Clive? Um, no, I don't have Clive. Oh, you don't I... have Clive. So Clive is our SMEMA only, so it's oh, okay. right, the uh the SMEMA inter interlocking. It's such a I thought, you know, I thought the I, I, I presume the solutions are, are are already out there. But we had so many requests of people that just want to stop and start SMEMA and all SMEMA is is basically a traffic light system it's a stop start break a circuit open a circuit solution a uh, situ um, uh, signal based messaging mm -hmm. system and uh, yeah a lot of customers just wanted they, they were trying to buy Quentin and I was saying you don't need Quentin you, okay you, before before so I ask you my last question Clive Quentin wh where, where are these names coming from I don't know um, Clive is obviously an older chap so uh, oh, there you go okay he was, he, he was the he was the, well actually he's, he's named after clive sinclair which is the british computing entrepreneur um uh quentin there's no real link i just i just i googled uh, sophisticated names <laughs> to answer your question properly i guess uh, though there is an importance of uh, like i was talking about uh, before about ownership and identity so yes, why can't you name a, 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 your solution a name, a normal human name? You know, why not? My last question for you before we uh, before we wrap this up is, I'm going to ask you to you know get out the crystal ball and predict the future. And now the future in software world is like 10 seconds from now is the future. Mm. You know, and and the and the distant past is maybe 20 seconds ago. Um, so where and in, in, from your perspective, the world according to David. Um, is uh, what, what do you believe will be the next industrial revolution? You know, five point oh. What's what's coming? Oh, you, you throw me then. I was and gonna, I was and predict, predict the future. And what's happening with our current? You know, what's the future of our within four point oh, maybe four point one, four point two? What, what does that future look like? And then what's the next big revolution in in, in your world? Okay, I try and part the question of five point oh for a minute in my back of my mind. Um, I think. Generally, community, obviously, there's going to be improved. We're going to be more connected, um, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, as the generation comes up, the next generation comes up, it's, they're going to want an element of community. I'm already seeing that with LinkedIn. I remember when LinkedIn was a no-go zone. It was, uh, you know, it's only for recruit recruitment. Um, you know, do not go there. And I remember one of my uh, chairman of the company I worked for, he actually he advised me to get on LinkedIn. I thought, and he was quite an elderly guy at the time still is um uh and i can see by linkedin um the companies that are with it and on board and and uh modernizing let's say and the amount of staff that are engaging and um, this is again the barriers that need to be removed which is the sales and marketing manager should not be the only person speaking for your company it should be i want to hear from engineers i want to hear yes. from the community around so I think that's definitely going to change over the next 10 years or so. Um, I think the sales process might change a little bit. It was interesting to listen to previous, your previous guests about they published prices. Um, I think, you know, that this, if we want to go to digitalization and e-commerce, then it has to go hundred percent that way. How that works with a distribution network with a set, you know, people want to take their cut, but then you know, if we have the silver tsunami, maybe those businesses will kind of morph into other kind of be more service-based. Well, they're already service-based, but, you know, very technical service-based 
localized companies. Um, but yeah, how, how that works, I don't know. I know why people don't publish numbers and you know, all that kind of stuff. But there is one company that does, and that's Apple. And they're currently in the news quite often because the games developers want a lesser cut or they, they want Apple to take a lesser cut of their income. But Apple doesn't want this. And I can tell you the reason that is, is not because Apple wants to make lots of money. Of course it does. Um, it's because as soon as you have that complex cell structure, you have to employ lots more people and it gets really you know, messy and people say, oh, you've given them a discount. So why can't you give us a discount? So it becomes it makes it really simple. Yeah, really simple. And it's and the customer knows at the very start of what they, you know, it's, it's like going to a supermarket and, and going to the supermarket check, check out and saying, oh, this is a five. Or I want this for two. You just wouldn't. Right. But because it's very in front of you that that is the price. So I think we're going to go um, down that avenue, whether it happens with large equipment. I don't know. It would be amazing if it did. But who knows? Um. I think the next one is scrutiny of the industry because with community, you're going to get scrutiny. So I follow a, a YouTuber called Dave Jones, the EV blog, and he dismantles and reviews uh, lab equipment. And obviously that's fairly consumer. It's fairly hand, you know, it's fairly reachable kind of thing to review. But in this YouTube world, we're going to get more scrutiny, maybe by customers, maybe by reviewers. At the moment, we live in a world of, um, you know, the journalists are sponsored, so they're not going to say anything too bad. And this is where this, this community ele element is going to open up scrutiny. And so I would just say, be ready for that. I think the next generation will be, but it's interesting. So when, when I, when the Hermes standard first came out, I did a peer review on the internet and I just, as a peer review, you know, it's not going to be totally positive. I said that it's a very raw technology but it does the job. It's not really internet 4.0, sorry, industry 4.0 kind of stuff, but it's, it does the job. Um, I never got any feedback, but you know, I'm sure certain people took it certain ways, but I think that's the future. People will literally go and say what they view on, on certain things, whether it's a topic or a piece of equipment. So just be ready for that. Well, David, thank you so much for taking that time out of your coding schedule uh, late at night. I appreciate it. Um, my, for my audience who would like to know more about David uh, and um, his uh, company without a name, uh, I will have links to uh, David's contact information and uh, website um, in the show notes. So if you're listening to this on your favorite podcast app, uh, go to that podcast app and look at the show notes and the information will be there. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, right down here, there's a button that says show more, click that and you'll see David's uh, contact information. David, thanks again for being my guest. I really enjoyed our, our conversation. We hit a lot of different points, uh, but I, I do hopefully it, we sewed it all together at the end for everybody. So yeah. thanks again. I Thank appreciate you, Mike. All thanks for watching me. My pleasure. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and on our newest channel, Amazon Music, or virtually wherever you get your podcasts. A special thanks to Circuit Assembly Magazine's PCB Chat at pcbchat.com and Ascendo Reliability at reliability.fm for syndicating the show. Thanks also for your questions and episode suggestions. Please keep them coming. Send comments or episode suggestions to mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, click on the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when new episodes are released. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Once again, thank you so much for watching or listening. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and perhaps most importantly, keep doing it right. And I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.